this is a new thing I'm doing, and I really wanted to kick it off with an all-time American classic, you know, like one of the greats. Of course, you have The Godfather, Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, Lawrence of Arabia, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and its sequel, 2010, The Year We Make Contact. But I thought, why not the all-time American classic, the creme de la creme, the Citizen Kane of all movies? Citizen Kane. So in 1939, Orson Welles was a hot commodity. Coming off of the high of his much lauded 1937 modern duress Broadway adaptation of William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, which Welles wrote, directed, and co-starred in, and which was produced by the theater company that he co-founded. He was only 22, by the way. I've been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. Wells also found success in radio, most notably his 1938 broadcast of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, which caused a small panic among some of its listeners due to Wells' journalistic approach. Wells was dodging studio offers left and right. Enter RKO Pictures. So RKO handed Wells the mother of all studio contracts, giving him total creative control for two feature films, which was just unheard of at the time. Oh yeah, and it's important to note that Wells had never directed or even participated in a feature film production in his entire life. He was only 24 years old. This really ticked off the Hollywood studio system at the time, by the way, and they were totally mean girls about it. After two rejected pitches, Wells and RKO settled on a project Wells had been developing with co-writer Herman J. Mankiewicz, Mankiewicz, called Citizen Kane. Mankiewicz wrote the first draft while Wells simultaneously described his own version of the script, and Mankiewicz's script was heavily influenced by then-contemporary newspaper baron and politician William Randolph Hearst. Mankiewicz was once part of Hearst's exclusive social circle, but Mankiewicz grew to hate Hearst over time. And while there has been some debate dispute over the years today, it is widely acknowledged that while Mankiewicz played a large role in shaping Citizen Kane, the final vision was definitely that of Wells. The film attracted Hollywood's cream of the crop, including cinematographer Greg Toland, who at the time was perhaps the most valued and sought after cameraman working on the planet. Toland was attracted by Wells' planned use of experimental shooting techniques, a rare opportunity at that time in Hollywood. Wells, a first time film director, taught himself filmmaking by studying various movies of the time and then combining certain elements from each to create a new kind of filmmaking. He was 25 years old. Although there was a lot of pressure at the time from the Hollywood studio system to cancel the production altogether, primarily driven by William Randolph Hearst's silent but not so silent campaign against the film, Citizen Kane hit cinemas on May 1st, 1941 at the RKO Palace Theater in New York City. So the film tells the story of a newsreel reporter who sets out to uncover the mystery behind famed newspaper kingpin and politician Charles Foster Kane's dying word, Rosebud, an alleged inside reference to William Randolph Hearst, nicknamed for his mistress. The film breaks from the traditional chronological storytelling of the period and jumps back and forth in time between the reporter's interviews with Kane's former colleagues and Kane's own story in the past, beginning with his troubled childhood. His parents discover gold on their property and send young Charles to be raised by a successful banker until he comes of age and can claim his inheritance. We see Kane rise from idealist beginnings to become a businessman mogul and a true man of the people, leading him to run for governor of New York State. However, his political aspirations are squandered when both his wife and the public discover Kane's affair with a younger woman. Kane inevitably remarries, forcing his new bride into a career as an opera singer despite her lacking both the will and the talent for doing so. <laughs> So yeah, she leaves him too, and he's left to wilt away in the big mansion house he built for her. And he kind of earned it. So the reporter eventually just gives up his search after none of Kane's associates can identify who or what Rosebud is. 
Of course, it's at this point in the film, as Kane's estate is being liquidated, we watch as his childhood sled, which he had initially lost when he was given away, is put into a furnace, the word Rosebud printed across it. Bum, bum, bum! What's interesting about the cast of Citizen Kane is that most of the main players are actually appearing on film for the first time, and many of them are actually from Wells' own theater company, the Mercury Theater Group. The reporter Jerry Thompson is played by William Allen, who also voices the News on the March narrator, and while playing a key role in the film, no doubt, we never really get to know him beyond, you know, reporter man, and he basically just serves to avoid having to tell a straightforward biographical story and mix it up with some mystery and intrigue. Now, this isn't a criticism of the film by any stretch. The film doesn't need to flesh out the character of the reporter because that's not the focus. The reporter is merely a vessel by which the audience is toured through the sizzle reel of Charles Foster Kane's life. So Joseph Cotton makes his major feature debut anyway as Kane's closest friend and partner, Jedediah Leland. Um, Cotton would, of course, go on to become a big leading man and A-list star in his own right, but I do find his performance in Citizen Kane to be good, but, you know, not great. Ruth Warwick delivers a strong performance as Kane's first scorned wife, Emily. Ray Collins as the dastardly Jim Geddes is essentially Kane meeting his match, someone perhaps more ruthless than Kane himself. George Kolaris as Walter Thatcher, loosely based on J.P. Morgan, gives a very interesting performance because at times we're supposed to definitely be almost intimidated by Thatcher. However, at other moments, Thatcher is portrayed kind of in a lighter way, in a much more like comical light, mugging at the audience and breaking the fourth wall by looking directly into the camera. Oddly enough, however, it somehow works. Leave it to Orson Welles, despite a relatively jarring brief tonal shift. It's Welles having fun, and there are a few other examples of this in the movie. Now, this is a movie with a ton of characters, so I'm just going to skip over the rest of them and just get down to brass tacks. Orson Welles. Orson Welles' as Charles Foster Kane is nothing less than magnetic. He towers over all of his co-stars in both stature and presence. He really commands the screen anytime he's on it, and that's saying something for a person in his mid 20s. Part of what makes Orson Welles such a good fit for the titular role is because he and Charles Foster Kane are basically cut from the same cloth. Um, some aspects of the film can be more attributed to Herman J. Mankiewicz. The whole sled thing, for example, um, is actually um, alluding to a cherished childhood bike that he had and lost as a kid. But Kane's story mirrors many details um, from Welles' own life, although Welles claims he never noticed any parallels between himself and the character. Um, these similarities include being affluent at a very young age, having an abusive father, and being taken from his childhood home to a faraway big city, and then eventually being orphaned. But like any good artist, Wells likely used his pain to push his artistic limits, and for that he was a creative force. From a technical perspective, Citizen Kane was innovative, especially from an American film at the time, utilizing extreme angles, deep focus, longer takes, impressionistic lighting, overlapping dialogue, and more boundary-pushing techniques. The film also features award-nominated special effects makeup, which still holds up today. It's Acme University's Eyewitness News. Today, as it must to all spoiled brats, expulsion came to Montana Max. The richest kid in Acme Acres, Monty o Citizen Kane is one of those films that has definitely become ingrained within popular culture. Unfortunately, in its own time, the impact of William Randolph Hearst's threats could be seen immediately upon the film's initial release, as many theaters refused to screen it, and those that did saw the film mostly losing money, with very little profit to be found. By 1942, the film ended its theatrical run, and despite garnering almost nothing but praise from critics and going on to be nominated for nine Academy Awards in 1942, winning Best Original Screenplay for Wells and Mankiewicz, the film was considered a failure by RKO, however, and Wells lost favor among many American critics at the time. Hearst appeared to have won. It's the 1954 Sylvania Stratford. With a 21-inch screen and the great new photo power chassis for photographs. However, 15 years after the film's initial release, RKO released its film library to be screened on television for the very first time. This was the mid-1950s, which reintroduced Citizen Kane to the public right in their own homes. Additionally, American film critic Andrew Saris wrote a very popular essay that same year that dubbed the film The Great American Film. The film's reputation snowballed from there. Ladies and gentlemen, by way of introduction, this is a film about trickery and fraud, about lies. So Orson Welles 
I think nobody would argue, was a fearless artistic genius who pushed the limits of cinema and raised the bar for all time. Um, Wells went on to have highs and lows in his career, for sure, in a string of unfinished films, and lived his last few years like any other aged movie star, you know, commercials and documentaries and stuff. The legacy of Citizen Kane can be seen across all cinema today, from Steven Spielberg to Martin Scorsese, from Batman to Blade Runner. What Wells and his team did changed the direction of cinema forever, and that's profound for someone who probably could barely grow a mustache. I have heard it suggested that Citizen Kane is in some sort of sense autobiographical. The notion that Kane himself is some sort of version of myself, uh, I, I'd really fail to recognize. Maybe out of blindness, but it seems to me that Kane is a... Uh, uh, everything that I'm not. Good and bad. <laughs> And as always, guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click like below. And if you want to see more videos like it, just go ahead and click subscribe.